You're listening to TIP. So today's a really exciting show for us because we're talking with one of our good friends, Guy Spear. Uh, when we first started our podcast, Guy was one of the very first guests that came on the show, and he's the founder of the Aquamarine Hedge Fund, and he's a Warren Buffett-style investor. Guy is also the author of the best-selling book, The Education of a Value Investor, and he's a graduate of Harvard and Oxford. Uh, during our discussion, we cover a wide array of topics like what kind of daily readings he looks at, uh, the impact of statistics and humility, credit cycles, cryptocurrencies, and much, much more. So I'm excited to bring you guys this episode. Stig was out of town and unable to participate in the call, but he'll be with us again next week. So if you're ready, let's go ahead and do this. You are listening to The Investor's Podcast, where we study the financial markets and read the books that influence self-made billionaires the most. We keep you informed and prepared for the unexpected. All right, so uh, we are super pumped to have our good friend Guy Spear back on the show again. It has been a very long time. You know, that when we talked to Guy last, I want to say it was like episode 15 or it was very, very early in the show. And I distinctly remember this interview because we got so many emails from people saying that interview was insane. It was so good. So Guy, it's been way overdue. I know when we were talking in Omaha back at the shareholders meeting this past year, I said, when are you coming back on the show? And you said, I'm going to come back on in the fall. And I said, I'm going to hold you to it. And so uh, here you are. You're a man of your word. And we appreciate you taking time out of your very busy day to talk with us. I was delighted to accept the invitation to come back on. And you know, don't put up the other podcast too much because then people might just be disappointed by this one. You know? <laughs> so for the listeners, what's worth saying is that this year, I got to meet Preston at the Berkshire Annual General Meeting. And so for the listeners and any of you who haven't been to Omaha, I walked into this bar and I thought, I thought I'd walk into the back and find this kind of nerdy guy with maybe three friends and then we'd have a nice chat. Until I realized that the whole bar, all 120 people, are Preston and his gang. <laughs> and Preston is just totally pumped. And everybody there is totally pumped. And, you know, it's, it's actually, and it's an inspiration. Hey, so going into the questions. So we opened this up to our Twitter community. A lot of them are very big fans of yours and they had some really interesting questions. One of the first ones that I really want to hit at, because I think this is so fundamental to where we're at in space and time here in 2017, Akash, he asked, how does an investor build patience and temperament? And this is something that we know Buffett and Munger talk about so much, but I think for a lot of people that maybe aren't as attuned to their teachings, they hear the word temperament and they hear the word patience and it's just kind of cliche. So can you talk to us why this is such an important yeah. concept? It is, but you know, of all the questions and I've got them out in front of me, I found that this was the one that I was most nonplussed about actually, because I mean, I walk around saying, oh, I need to build my patience and my temperament and I'm going to try and it's more, I would argue, the case that I feel the forces that make me want to sell something that I've just bought or make me want to buy back something that I've just sold. And I find myself having to, you know, just go back each time to the fundamental analysis that I did and focus on the logic of the fundamental analysis. But it was hard for me to think through. I didn't have any easy answers for Akash. And Ashok Akash, it's a great question, but maybe what I'm reaching for is that you can't build temperament and patience in isolation is going to be related to something. You know, it's like if you're in a difficult marriage, and everybody's marriage is difficult sometimes, the way I would argue that one builds patience and temperament there is to say, well, you know, I know she's going through a tough patch. I know our relationship's going through a tough patch. I'm not going to do anything until another month, or another three months. And, and by the way, that's the same. If we think of long distance running or long distance anything, we know that if you're at the beginning of a marathon and you say, I'm going to run the whole marathon, that can be devastating. But if you say, I'm just going to run to that lamppost or I'm going to do anything, but I'm just not going to stop jogging. So if I bring it back to investing, because obviously the question is investing, I go through, I, I think of myself during the financial crisis of 2008-9, you know, one day it's in my book, my analyst comes into my office and he tells me he's gone to cash. 
And I was kind of angry with him because I felt like I didn't want to have somebody in my office claim to cash when I knew intellectually that was the wrong thing to do. But I also was feeling an awful lot of fear. And I, I just remember saying to myself and saying to some of my investors, like, look, I know that Nestle is worth an enormous amount of money, way more than where it's trading from for I'm just not going to sell it. I'm not going to sell a great business just because people are panicking. But I guess the key is that you don't build it in isolation. You build it in relation to the specific challenges that you have on that day. And it's kind of building the connection between what we intellectually know to be true. For example, buy and hold is the right thing to do. But down to the specifics of, you know, I'm feeling this incredible fear. I'm feeling this compelling need to sell my stocks along with everybody else. But I know intellectually this isn't the right thing to do. And that's kind of a little similar to the idea of not wanting to break out of the run when you're on the uh, marathon. So, Guy, what do you think about people that write down their principles, their trading principles, before they put the position on? So if you're talking specifically about Nestle, it might be something like, I'm going to buy this. The reason that I might sell this would be reason X, Y, and Z. And you list some of this stuff out in writing before you would put the position on. That way you can reference that. You can look at your principles and you can say, hey, this wasn't one of my principles. This wasn't something that I'm thinking about. So this is probably an emotional thing. Is that something that you believe would work? And is that something that you do? I mean, I think it's a more general. Yes, it's definitely a good thing to do. It's not the only route to take, but I think that you're just enunciating a, a specific of a more general principle that the more conscious we are, what what we're doing and what's going on, the better it is. And writing is a great way to become more conscious of yourself. Even better would be to keep an investment diary. And it's just, I found it very, very hard to keep an investment diary, but I do I actually use Evernote. I have it on all my devices. And um, when I'm thinking something that I feel like I ought to capture, I go and capture it in Evernote. And some of it's related to investing and some of it isn't. If I do it, yeah, actually now, it's kind of like I told my regulator here that this is what I do. And now I kind of like, I have to do it. And I like that because it keeps me more disciplined than I'd be able to keep myself. Before I buy any stock, I have to write a paragraph, at least a paragraph. And I go through, it's on an Excel spreadsheet. I go through a checklist of about 70, 75 items. And many of them I leave blank. They just don't apply. But on many of them, I write something. So I think that's a really, really good thing to do. But at the end of the day, you know, Akash, the question is, how do you build patience in the abstract? I would argue it's how do you find the patience to own that stock that's been in your portfolio for three years and hasn't moved? And how do you resist the temptation to sell? And, and then that becomes a little bit more concrete. And then maybe there are some some strategies that one can come up with when one gets to some concrete situation. Interesting. So let's talk about kind of your daily routine. When you get into the office, one of the questions we saw on Twitter as well was, what publications do you read daily? And I like this one. Do you listen to any other podcasts? <laughs> so, you know, one of my goals, actually, you know what you got to do? What you need to do is you need to come out and visit me for a week. <laughs> yeah, you'll stay with us. You'll see that my library is a great place to conduct some interviews. And so anyway, I'd love to have you over here sometime. We would Maybe love we, to come out there. It would be great. But when you come into my office, basically, uh, you can go left or you can go right. To go left takes me to the room I'm in right now, which is my busy room. It's where computers are. And if I go right, get to my library. There's no electronic devices and there's lots of books. And my goal is to spend more time going right and going left just as a matter of habit. And actually, I find, I mean, there are some days I don't make it in there at all. But the days I just go in there and I sit, even for 10 or 15 minutes, it kind of clears my head. You know, it helps me to see what I'm supposed to be thinking about or doing. Yeah, so this is like your form of meditation. You know, there's, there's people that swear by meditation. There's other people that say that they have like a different routine that's similar to meditation. This is fascinating. I love this idea of not carrying an electronic device into the room. When did you start doing that and talk to us about this whole idea? Because I love this. Oh, I mean, actually, yeah, sometimes I do have my mobile phone with me, but it's a great point that it's just that there's no computers or there's no phone in there. 
when I shut the door on that room, what people in my office, I tell them, pretend that I'm outside the office. So, you know, if somebody calls, I'm not here. I stepped out. But sometimes, I mean, sometimes I do have my mobile phone with me. I didn't actually think through that far. I would also say that it's very mild meditation. I mean, I'm deeply impressed with Yuval Hariri and his one month a year on the Pastor Meditation Retreat in India, which he credits with the two great books that he's written. And there's a guy I know here, the company is Bavaria Capital, it's a publicly trained company. He does regular 10-day Vipassana meditation retreats. And I actually have not managed to do that. I think that that's what I really need to do to train my mind. So I think I've got, I've figured out meditation ultralight, but it's not much more than meditation ultralight. And it's a place that just makes me a little bit more quiet. But my point being that well, the minute I get into my office and you can see some of it, I've gone through. So I had an enormous amount of publications coming in, but they're not the first thing I look at. The thing that I really try and look at is whatever the hell I've printed out, which might be a penny report or a 10K, or it might be some background reading that I'm doing. Like I'm now reading everything I can from Vaclav Smil. Vaclav Smil is just this amazing engineering mind who really thinks about societal problems. And I'm trying to understand more about oil. So I'm reading plenty about the oil industry. And the publications, though, that are regular for me, I love the manual of ideas. I love the new format. But I have to say that at some point, I love finding out about investors who are out there. But at some point, you have to get away from reading about investing and reading for investing. But on, on publications, about two years ago, I had subscriptions to Automotive News, Scientific American, The New Scientist. Nature, Advertising Age. I mean, there are publications that are done by cranes. And I was kind of drowning in paper. At some point, I said, right, I'm just going to go on a, a publications diet. I'm going to get rid of the vast majority of them. And then if I decide to resubscribe, I'll resubscribe to some of them. But these industry publications really sort of like bury you in paper in a certain way. Another one was Aviation Weekly, which is a great publication. But on some level, I felt like that was the sort of like walking around the forest, looking at the ferns and not seeing the trees. The publications I didn't give up are The Economist and Business Week. And I don't like the design of Business Week, but I think that it's got an awful lot of great stories in it. And there's a, there's a publication I get here in Switzerland called Bilanz, which is like the Swiss version of Fortune magazine. And fun enough, I think our um, Fortune subscription stopped, and I think I need to get that one back because I like what's in there. And I actually, sort of like daily publications, I still get four newspapers. So I get the Financial Times, I get Neue Zurche Zeitung. On a weekly basis, I get Le Monde. I get the New York Times International. So that kind of is piling up. But I, the truth is I don't read it on a daily basis. But every now and then when I fly somewhere, I'll take eight of them all the magazines and I'll read through them because I find that I am reading more and more of those news publications on my iPhone, basically. Yeah. But the thing is, I used to get grants publication physically, and then I, I've, I kind of re-engaged with my Bloomberg monitor, and now I get grants on the Bloomberg monitor, and every now and then I'll print it out to read. I think that w what I have going on is that in spite of the magazines not coming in, some time ago I decided to buy I kind of pretty much any company I look at that half interests me, I go and buy one share in my Charles Schwab account and I make sure that my Charles Schwab account is set up to get physical delivery of mail. So you know, I'm getting proxies and 10 Qs. I mean, I just got a two-inch think proxy on the merger of two companies, Praxair and Linda. And so, you know, that's like sort of, it really is a two-inch think document that's been sent to me. And I'll, I'll find that those things are sort of lying around along with whatever the hell else I'm looking at. If you're looking at something, you know, there's some corporate presentations to print out, there's some 10Ks and Qs, and I have a really high quality, large printer that has paper handling and stapling. So when I print out 60 page documents, it prints out on double side. And that's kind of stuff that I carry around myself and I'm looking at all the time. So I'd say that's the stuff that I'm trying to read, trying to focus on. Now, long answer to a short question. No, but it, to me, it sounds like the focus is really the 10 Ks and the 10 Qs. Like you don't miss a 10 Q that comes out for any business you own. Would that be a correct statement? 
No, I, I think I do miss quite a few. But I'm printing out the ones I think are interesting and are important to look at. And by the way, something just really important that, you know, if this was a written article, I'd want this to be a call-out quote. I gave a talk to the Swiss CFA Society, which I was quite pleased with. It came out reasonably very well, I thought. And one of the points that I made, Preston, is that, so I really appreciate your respect for me. It's really kind of you, and thank you. But I mean, all you have to do is read Nassim Taleb's book, All Parandomness, and it's very convincing that I have a 20-year track record. I'm two percentage points approximately better than the S&P. So that's a good return. It's not Omaha numbers, but it's still market beating. But there's no way that you could prove to a person who understands how the numbers work, whether I'm lucky or smart. So, you know, you're interviewing me and I'm what I'm doing. The, you know, the story is you take a thousand people and you run a coin flipping contest. You keep, keep flipping coins round one, round two, round three. And you find the person who's flipped a series of heads. And if a thousand people, if you go however many times it is, there will be one guy who flipped a series of heads. When you go and interview that guy, and they've done this experiment in academic circles, the guy who's flipped a series of heads really genuinely feels like he's got some kind of skill, and you, he's sort of like, what is it? And the way you flip the coin, and you know, humans are sort of superstitious creatures, and we stop believing stuff. So what am I trying to say is that your listeners, the Investors Podcast community, should not necessarily draw lessons from what I'm saying. This is just interesting to hear what Guy Spear does. But we cannot rule out that I'm just a coin flipper who happens to have flipped a high number of heads for many reasons that have got nothing to do with what I'm talking about right now. I think the learning point for me when I hear you say that is you have to be self-aware. You have to know what those probabilities are, and then you have to have zero ego and total humility to be at a point where after 20 years and you've beat the market after 20 years, but you're saying you don't have statistical proof that you've beat the market with high probability, a large confidence interval to basically say there's statistical proof. I think that that's insanely profound. And the reason I think it's profound is because it's telling people, even after 20 years, if you're not looking at things through that kind of lens and saying, you know, I might be wrong, my thought process might be wrong. That's the learning point for me. We were reading Ray Dalio's new book, The Principles Book. And in the book, he talks about how. He went through this just destruction of his company back, I want to say it was in 81, just literally lost everything. And he said, I went from asking myself, why am I right, to asking myself, why am I wrong? And that became his thesis for everything. Like, how am I wrong? What, what am I doing right now that proves that I'm wrong? And I think that that's what you're really getting at with your comment is, yeah. am I wrong right now? Oh. Is all this information that I'm talking about just dead wrong? Yeah, so that, you know, what the way I would state it is you can't rule out, I don't know what the confidence interval is, but you can't rule out that the guy is just a lucky coin flipper. And your listeners, the listeners should take that into account when you're asking me questions about what the hell I do when I get up every day, do I turn left or right, what's my meditation process, all of those things. And then, you know, I get the feeling, I mean, I if you take Manish Pabrai, he reads a lot more than I do. And, and I do think that it has an impact on returns. And why does he read a lot more? He's just got a brain for it. I don't know what. I mean, I'm not saying I don't read a lot. I think I read a lot. But I think that he reads more. And it's kind of like it's cumulative. I mean, if I read, I don't know, 300, I don't read 300. Maybe if I read 100 books a year, he's reading 150 or 200 a year. Yeah. And that does make a difference. I'm not saying that I don't absorb the ideas as well as he does. But on the reports, I think here's what's really important, Preston, is that whatever it is you're doing, you've got to be doing it intelligently. And I think that that's something that when Todd Coombs talked about his 500 pages a day, I think that it stimulated a lot of people to like find 500 pages a day to read. But you've got to be intelligent about how you're reading it. I mean, if you've got a, if you're reading an annual report or if you're reading a 10Q and you know there's nothing's changed in the business, don't force yourself to read every word. Be smart. So just for context for the audience, Todd Combs, who Guy is mentioning, that's who everyone thinks is going to be the replacement to Buffett. This is who Buffett has basically tapped as kind of being his replacement after he dies. And, you know, talking about this idea of education, which is just a huge theme for our show, an ongoing theme of our show, 
I think this is really neat to highlight. When Buffett was asked, well, how did you make your selection of Todd and Ted? And Buffett came back. He said, you know, these two are the only two guys we could find that read more than Charlie and I. And I love that quote. It is such a profound quote of what he values. And what he values is people that are just going through an enormous spurt of learning at all times. And I just think that's just so incredibly important. And I think it goes back to our first point of temperament. You know, like you're going to have great temperament if you know what the hell's going on. So another way that I think that I want to answer that question is that, I mean, I don't know. I live inside my brain. I don't live inside anybody else's brain, but I feel like my brain is kind of like an unruly horse that is galloping around an enclosure. But every now and then, every now and then, you know, the horse notices a good objective in the distance. And I'm in a position to ride that horse. And then I got to freaking ride that horse to that objective. And the key is actually, I would argue, to get the worst thing is to have read something that says do 500 pages a day, which is not the objective of the horse that I'm riding, you know? And like, in a certain way, ride towards meaningful objectives or pay attention towards meaningful objectives. And when at meaningful objective changes, then don't keep moving towards the same thing out of some kind of sense of duty or slavish desire to follow some precept that you've read somewhere. Move on to the new objective. You know, In a certain way, maybe this encapsulated this idea of being a learning machine. Learning machines change directions. Learning machines stop halfway through books when they really realize there's nothing else in there for them. Learning machines don't waste time reading stuff that's not worth reading. And for what it's worth saying is that for your audiences, I'm not saying that I'm a learning machine. For me, it's an aspiration as much as it is for everyone in the Infest Investors podcast. Yeah, I mean, something that I far prefer to read books, but I actually find myself reading an awful lot on a Kindle because when I get into bed next to my wife, she's not going to let me switch the light on, but Kindle's fine. So now I find myself, but I love the physical copy of books, so I find myself buying two copies, a Kindle copy and a hard copy. And What can I say? Awesome. So this is a question that came up on Twitter, and I, I guess I'm going to just kind of change it a little bit because it related to credit cycles. So one of my frustrations with the value investing community is the complete just lack of respect for macro. I think that when you talk to most really hardcore Warren Buffett investors, they just say, yeah, I, I have no idea what macro is going to do. I just ignore it, and I just focus on the small cap, large cap businesses, and I look at it from that vantage point, just buy in equities. And so Howard Marks wrote his incredible book, and he talks about kind of knowing where you're at in a credit cycle. And he really goes against a lot of the literature that you see with Buffett and Munger. And so I really applaud Marks for this because I'm in the same camp as him. I think that it's very important. It'd almost be like if you were looking at a spectrum and value investing is in one part of the spectrum, then you got macro investors in another part of the spectrum. My opinion is, is if you have knowledge of all those spectrums, you're going to be more informed and more knowledgeable and can work inside of your environment better. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on that idea. And then I'm also curious that if you kind of think that it's important to kind of know where you're at in a credit cycle, where would you put us in the credit cycle today as you think through this? Because my personal opinion is whenever I look at this past credit cycle, it's been completely manipulated by central banks. And the signaling that I'm seeing is that the U.S., specifically the Bank of Japan, they're done with their quantitative easing for the most part. The only one that's still in town pumping out money is the ECB, and it's looking like they're going to start winding down, which for me is signaling the end of the credit cycle or that we're at the top of the credit cycle. So I'm curious your thoughts on all that stuff. I know it's a lot of speculation and we have no idea, but I think it's important for people to be thinking about that and knowing the risks that are associated with it. If you like reading about the credit cycle, you'll enjoy Grant's because he has this central page where you see what the central bank did. Say the resource again. Grant's interest rate observer. Jim Grant, I mean, he's, he's a, what, what do we call him? He's part of the scaffolding of Wall Street. I mean, he's been around for so long. He's an incredibly talented writer. He's been writing this publication for a very long time. It includes a lot of macro stuff related to the credit cycle, actually. And then he's always connected up to some interesting idea or other that he'll print on his pages. So it's kind of, I've never attended one of his conferences, but 
he predates a lot of the new media stuff. And I think this is surprisingly influential. I think that I, at the end of the day, Preston, come out saying that I'm better off not allowing the credit cycle to determine my investment decisions. Or I think that here's the benefit of ignoring the credit cycle is if you ignore the credit cycle and try and buy cheap stocks that will do well no matter what, and if you pay attention to the credit cycle, there's this huge danger that you end up becoming some kind of closet market timer of one kind or another. And so if you're super brilliant and you're capable of paying attention to the credit cycle and allowing that to steer you in where you pay attention and what stocks you buy, then, then that's really fantastic. But I think that for the vast majority of us, or for many of us, looking at the credit cycle, which in and of itself is not a terrible thing to do, will lead to the next step, which is to start timing the market, which is probably a terrible thing to do. So, And I completely agree with what you just said. That makes total sense. But then whenever I look at Buffett's balance sheet, which for me is, is the truth, like when he goes on TV and he says whatever, that's less meaningful to me than what his income statement and balance sheet say. That's what I really pay attention to. I don't yeah. necessarily listen to what he says. And so whenever I look at the balance sheet and I see that he's sitting on $100 billion, $100 billion of cash, that doesn't make any sense. The argument falls apart. For me personally, it falls apart because when you're sitting in cash, you're effectively saying, uh, I'm going to select a negative 1% or 2% return. That's what you're physically doing by looking at that on the balance sheet. So why not take, and I know he has a huge problem because it's such a large amount of capital. And I hear that argument all the time. Oh, he's just sitting on too much money. He can't move it. Well, you know, you could move it into an ETF, which is priced at a 3% or 3.5% return today. He could do that, which is better than a negative 1% return, but he's not doing that. That's where my, I'm like, it seems like he's saying one thing and doing something different. I'm curious to hear what you think. He could also pay out a dividend. You know, he could just start sending it back. No, I mean, it's an enormously profound statement that he's making. He's saying that he believes that at some point within the reasonably near future, he's going to get the opportunity to put $100 billion to work or most of it to work in some opportunity that right now he can't see, but conditions will arise that will make that possible. You know, it would be something like buying Bank of America or buying JP Morgan or buying General Motors. It would be an enormous purchase. And he's basically implicitly saying, I believe I'll get that opportunity. So somebody said, a CFO of a business inside Berkshire Hathaway that I met a long time ago said these wise words to me, which you figured out as well, Preston, which is pay attention to what Warren Buffett does. It's more important than what he says he does. And ideally, you get the stereo picture. But yeah, there is a, a bit of a dissonance there. Guy, whenever I started out in studying Buffett, from what I read, I was under the impression that I'm not ever going to think about what the market's about to do. All I'm going to do is I'm going to look at right now what is offering me the fattest yield with the lowest amount of risk. And yeah. whatever that is, I take my cash flow for this month and I stuff it into whatever that asset is. And so if that was a true statement today, because that's what all the literature says, is that's how he does his approach. I don't have to predict anything. I just have to know what's going to give me the best yield today, and then that's what I buy. But that argument falls apart when you look at his balance sheet at the top of credit cycles. When you go back historically, he starts putting a lot of money into liquidity. Now, in the past, like you go back to 2008, he was buying bonds because there was yield there. But now there's not really any yield in bonds that is, that's worth the spread to cash and you're seeing them sitting in, you know, some bonds that are short maturities, but I mean, it's cash equivalents. I don't know. I, I guess I'm just having a hard time understanding his uh, actions. Well, maybe, I mean, I'm not that I can explain them, but maybe what I'm about to say will help a little. It's worth also saying that he's not sold anything. So the cash is building up because, you know, profits are coming through and he's not doing anything with them. But he's not made a move like he's not said, I think the market's feeling a little toppy. I'm going to sell my portfolio of securities. Well, I think so, the guy, with, with all due respect, that's due to the cap gains. You know, like he's not going to sell Coca Cola because his cap gains are just going to, I mean, he's making more on the dividend than his purchase price for some of these things like Coca Cola. So 
He's not going to sell out of those just because he's going to get murdered in taxes. But when you look at the companies like IBM, he had no capital gains. He's selling that. You know what I mean? Like I but don't know. I'm he, just he's selling that for fundamental reasons. He's decided it's not as as he said at the Berkshire annual meeting. He's decided it's not as good a business as he thought originally thought it was. I would argue that there's a there's a kind of an asymmetry when it comes to investing. Where I mean, you get it when people talk about a particular price being a good entry point for a stock. Kind of saying once you've entered into it, you're not going to pay attention too much and whether it becomes overvalued or not. And I think that it's far harder to sell stocks well than it is to buy stocks well. I think Warren Buffett's saying, I'm going to let this cash build up. I don't want to sell anything that's in my portfolio other than the stuff that I positively don't like. But all the businesses that are good businesses, I'm going to let them ride. Maybe sometimes, like Coca-Cola, they'll get overvalued. But I'm only going to add in significant chunks to my investment when I know that I'm being offered really, really ridiculous prices. So there's this asymmetry in that you buy when things are cheap, but you don't necessarily sell when things are super expensive. And I think that that's what he's doing. The cash builds up. And here's the point, I think, for me, that I just think is really, really important. And I don't know how to square this with awareness of the credit cycle. So I think we can all agree that 2008-9 was a trough in the credit cycle, credit contracted in a massive way, and credit continued to contract in a massive way because the system sort of like had these self-reflexive mechanisms like the drawing in of credit at the banks, more stringent capital requirements, more stringent requirements on bond ratings meant that it was just much harder to get money for many, many people. And now we're probably five years into a sort of a long credit expansion. And I think that the the danger of thinking about that is then, when is that credit expansion coming to an end? Is it coming to an end in six months? Is it coming to an end in four years? And obviously, if we knew that it was coming to an end in six months, we might want to position ourselves very differently in our portfolios than if it's coming to an end in four years. And I think that that's where it's really hard to tell. And I think of myself, there are so many times when I felt like I've had so much evidence that we're at a turning point in terms of stocks going up. The last time was when so many of my friends felt like with the election of Donald Trump that it was time to get out of the market because he was going to be a total disaster. And the market totally surprised everyone. And I can't say that I didn't have the same feeling I did. I was like, oh, gosh, I'm not feeling very comfortable about a Trump presidency. I don't know how it's going to work out. I never let that interfere with the desire to basically be fully invested as much as I can. In terms of central banks, again, I think your point is well taken, that when you look, whatever the hell explanations I'm trying to give you, and your point is when you look at the behavior of Warren Buffett, he appears to be looking at the credit cycle and making decisions related to the credit cycle. And, you know, I can't prove it to you, but maybe somebody who's super well attuned to valuations is obviously their portfolio is going to look that way, even though they're not consciously aware they're doing it. But just to address something that you talked about, central banks, this idea that the central banks are manipulating stuff. The central banks always have manipulated stuff and always will manipulate stuff. That's what central banks do. That's why we went off the gold standard. That's nothing new. I agree with you, but it's not something that we should get upset about. They manipulate it. They believe that they're doing the right thing at the time. And you know, there's enormous debate that goes on in academic circles to figure out what the right thing to do is. It's a very, very powerful lever that they pull. I would tell you that someone, I don't have the exact quote, but it's along the lines of never get into an argument with somebody who prints money by the something. I don't remember what it is. The central banks have this towering, it's very, very hard to comprehend. They can just switch on the spigot as much as they like. They have enormous, enormous, enormous power, and one should never bet against them. And you have this kind of dichotomy. They open the sluice gates in a major, major way, and nobody can really understand why inflation didn't take off. There are all sorts of explanations, but nothing that's definitive. Japan's been in that kind of state for more than 20 years. So exactly at what point they stop the QE and what would make them restart it again is hard to understand. And again, you just don't want to get on the wrong side of that. That's what I would say.
Yeah. No, I think it's a major concern. So my sense is, Preston, that you've been talking to some sort of, so in the gold world, you'd call them gold hounds or gold something. Gold bugs. And so, yeah, and, and monetary purists, if you like. So, and then, you know, and I was one of those guys. I was like, these people are just pacing the currency. You know, it's just terrible, QE. And it was at one of the West Coast meetings, so somebody asked Charlie Munger about this. You know, if you look at the purchasing power of a nominal U.S. dollar over the last 100 years, so what a dollar was worth uh, 100 years ago is like two cents now. So cash is constantly depreciating. And Charlie Munger just looks up at the room and he says, and this is good. I don't know why you're complaining. It could be a lot worse. So <laughs> what central banks do is that they over time debase the currency and they do it in the interests of all sorts of other things. And we as investors can't get upset about that. I would argue that the answer to that is that clearly you should see the currency as a way of transacting stuff, but don't stick around in that cash for too long because you know which way it's going. It's going very seriously south. And which to come back to, you know, in, in, on the day that Bitcoin bounced above $10,000, so, you know, it's great to say that. And that just going back to Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway is again an, an incredible statement. For Warren Buffett to say, I know the cash I own is depreciating at some rate per year, and I still prefer to hold it because I think I'll buy something, I'll get the opportunity to buy something within a reasonable period of time that's going to make it worth my while. So the whole Bitcoin thing is probably one of the craziest discussions happening right now. I recently did a Google Trends kind of search with Bitcoin in it to kind of see the global map the heat map of where it's being discussed. And when I did yeah. that, it's literally being discussed almost in every single country around the world. And no more so, and you know where the hottest spot was on the map? It was Switzerland. So I know there's conversations happening in Switzerland that yeah. you're hearing about Bitcoin. Now, I want to throw out an idea and I want to hear your thoughts on this idea. So all these fiat currencies are depegged and they have been for a very long period of time. And so there's no incentive for countries domestically, no incentive whatsoever to be responsible with their spending because as they devalue it, it manufactures growth domestically. So we basically have a race to devalue currencies that's happening around the world. And now all of a sudden this technology enters the space through Bitcoin, blockchain technology, Bitcoin's the emerging protocol compared to all the other ones that are out there. And you look at the market cap of this space, and it's now at $315 billion. So this is not, we're not talking about something that's like a little science experiment anymore. Like we're approaching, at the pace we're going, we're approaching a trillion dollars in this space extremely fast. And this is becoming very real. And if this becomes real, we now have a peg. And we don't just have a peg domestically, we have a peg globally. And so I guess my question is this, are we seeing a reenactment of 1921 in Germany, but only on a global level? So, you know, I think that Bitcoin is a complex phenomenon. When the history gets written, when we have the perspective of 100 years, we'll see that there were many things going on. And so I don't think there's any one way to describe it. but here are a few things. I think that I, in the past, underappreciated the simple network effects. So the more Bitcoin gets embedded in all sorts of different things, the more other currencies are created using Bitcoin as the reference, the more software embeds Bitcoin. The network effects of being the first mover, it's the cyber currency with the largest reach. And that in and of itself, may give it an intrinsic value that it didn't have before. So exactly the same protocol, exactly the same everything. It's a much smaller network, and it could get blown out of the water. But the intrinsic value in this is the same as the intrinsic value of writing for iOS or writing for Windows, writing for um, Android or any of those things. So there's no question in my mind that that probably does lend Bitcoin an intrinsic value, even though the protocol itself could be replicated by thousands of people. And it, um, and it is being replicated by thousands yeah. of people with, the, with all the forks. 
So the next thing that I feel like I want to say about Bitcoin is, you know, I don't think that anybody disagrees that the underlying blockchain technology is extremely valuable and we can separate out the blockchain technology and what that means for transactions, banking system, and many other systems and separate that from Bitcoin. And people say that we're in the age that the blockchain is where the internet was in the 19, the early 1990s. And I think that that's probably true. And there are a couple of Ethereum-based currencies that I am really interested in, Augur, A-U-G-U-R, and Gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, because I love these political betting markets and they keep getting shut down for all sorts of reasons. And I'm really looking forward to those two companies getting going because I think there'll be so many ways to use it. So I'm excited about that. And but, I want to comment on that because that's a really important point because a lot of the smart contract piece of this is reliant on technology that proves whether something is true or false through these poll type protocols that are true or false type prediction markets. So if you're entering into a smart contract with something and it's reliant on whether something happened or didn't happen, the way that that can be proven to be true is through some type of blockchain protocol through Ethereum. Yeah. It seems like Ethereum is the one that's doing this, but I completely agree with you. So we'll have the the links to those in the show notes for people to check it out. This is not in any way investment advice. All this stuff with crypto yeah. and blockchain is extremely risky, but it's interesting stuff that people need to be aware of. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Keep going there, guy. So, so here's another sort of what I think about Bitcoin is that you have to distinguish between hard and soft currencies. So you have economies in the world which are dollarized anyway, like in Zimbabwe. Nobody actually used Zimbabwe currency because it isn't worth the paper it's written on. And the only reason why you would kind of hold a Zimbabwe note is because the the central bank makes the promise to automatically exchange into some either dollars or euros or and that's the same in or was the same last time I looked closely in places like Argentina. And those are countries where the governments don't stand for much, or the governments are fickle and governments are capable of nationalizing property, doing all sorts of things. So I could see the move to hard currencies or more trusted currencies in those countries. And it's worth saying that those countries can be pretty good at preventing the dollar, the Swiss franc, the euro, the yen from being a legal tender in those countries. But Bitcoin gives people a way to go to something that is a much more, at least from the perspective of being living in Zimbabwe or Argentina, a much more safe bet. So is it easy to see why Bitcoin would displace some soft currency like the Zimbabwe dollar or the Argentinian peso? I don't find that hard at all. But if you ask me if I can foresee a world in which Bitcoin displaces hard currencies like the Swiss franc, the dollar, the euro, the yen, that I find it much, much harder to see because let's not underestimate what stands behind the US dollar. You know, some of those helicopters that you were fighting in stand behind the, the US dollar and a whole bunch of other stuff. And if I just go back to Bitcoin for a second, so market cap $300 billion, what I'd like to know, and I have not seen, and I don't know if that number exists, is what have been the flows in Bitcoin? So what have been the flows? The money flows in and out. And I would suspect that what we see in the last two or three years is a period where they've been enormous. The, the inflows have been far greater than the outflows. But we'll get a, to a point sometime in the history of Bitcoin where the outflows will be enormous. And will the currency be able to stand that? And at the end of the day, when you hold a dollar, what you hold is the ability to claim something from the US government and the U.S. government has real power. You know, it has a military, it has tanks, it has all sorts of things, all, all of the instruments of state, and you have the ability to claim something from them. Whereas Bitcoin, I think the only thing that leads to intrinsic value is this idea that there's somebody who will accept it from you, broad acceptance. But it's a very real difference between Bitcoin and real currencies. You know, when we think about how the universe works in general, there's balance to everything. There's a plus side and there's a negative side. So whenever I think about what we've experienced in 71, it's like we're living in a world that's lopsided. You only have central banking. You have nothing else that's keeping that in check and forcing 
governments to be responsible in the way that they spend. So it used to be gold, but that really kind of became manipulated. And then it, you know, we came off the gold standard. And now you look at how gold functions. It's not like you can go to Starbucks and use some ounce of gold in order to make a purchase. But I think that this brings the balance to the equation. Whenever I think about how this is taking place, this is going to add the yin and the yang to currency. It's going to peg it. I guess that's how it's going to act as a global peg. And who knows if this actually happens? It's just a theory. And I agree with you, Guy. I think that the people who are these maximalists that think that Bitcoin's going to take over everything and there's going to be no more dollars or there's going to be no more euros or whatever, I don't see that happening. I do see there being this equilibrium that will eventually occur. Now, when that happens, who knows? And the inflows that you're talking about are just... I mean, that's the thing to really pay attention to. And when I'm looking at the inflows to Bitcoin in the last you know, quarter, it's been astronomical. I mean, this has tripled in market cap since the middle of the summer. Tripled. Yeah. But just to be aware, you have a triple in market cap, no cash inflows. It's just the market cap is just the price at which people are trading or exchanging Bitcoin for dollars today. Well, wouldn't that be true? And I'm sorry to interrupt you, but wouldn't that be true if if we actually controlled the money supply? So, like, I agree with that statement. If I can contract the money supply, call it like the way that the central bankers do it, if they contract the money supply, they can actually boost the value of it. And you're not really adjusting the inflows, outflows. Those could be neutral by just adjusting that money supply. When we look at crypto, the supply that exists isn't something that anyone is actually manipulating or controlling. It's something that's completely the only crypto that's out there that's like that is Ripple. That's the only one that has a central authority. It was pre-mined coins, so they can adjust the supply and they can boost the market price because they're, you know, adjusting how many are outstanding in the marketplace. But when you look at all the other ones, they're not like that. I mean, so yeah, banks can manipulate the supply. I don't know about the other ones and the algorithm, the way it's written, does not allow Bitcoin to change the supply. But my simple point is, let's just imagine, just to give, make the point that you and I are the only two people who trade Bitcoin in the world. And so at $10,000 per Bitcoin, let's say for argument's sake today, a market cap of 300 billion, you and I could trade one Bitcoin for $10,000 and set a market cap for 300 billion. Yeah. We could trade one Bitcoin for $20,000 and set a market cap for 600 billion. But the total volume traded would be $10,000. So how much volume is traded and how much of the increase? So it's kind of the liquidity of the market, I guess, is what I'm saying. And there are measures that you can look at, the studies that you can look at that show how much money flowed into this commodity over the last month, or how much money is flowing out of a commodity. And are people removing their interest in the commodity or not? And how much money flowed out depends on the volume and the price at which it was trading. So if at ten thousand dollars per Bitcoin. And we show that there was a $30 billion inflow. That's interesting. Imagine that at $10,000 per Bitcoin, we could show that there was, I guess, is it possible to show an outflow? Let's say that people sold Bitcoin for dollars for a value of $10 billion. And there were enough new buys of Bitcoin at 10000 that it stayed at 10000 That, for me, is enormously significant. So if Bitcoin hit $10,000 per Bitcoin, as a result of $1 million going in and only $1 million worth of the existing Bitcoin holders willing to sell. That's a very different story to if it stays up there and there are tens of billion dollars flowing in. And so the people who've held it from zero to 10,000, you know, there is tens of billions of dollars who are able to get out. So the liquidity of Bitcoin is, I guess, what I'm trying to do. And daily volume traded is important. The answer, I mean, we'd have to go to the exchanges to get the answer. We'd have to go yeah. to Coinbase in America and some of these other ones because yeah. those guys definitely know those numbers. But I don't think yeah. anyone else outside of the exchanges would know what that is. But I think that that's the keys to this to understand how profound the movement really is. Yeah. One last thing that I've only learned recently, but is very, very important. So if I had a lot of my assets tied up in Bitcoin, which I don't, I think that I'd want to know what's going on there and I want to pay attention to those numbers. When you look at the economics of currency, there's been a spate of articles recently talking about how Bitcoin is very inefficient in terms of power consumption. So it turns out that Bitcoin uses more power than some small states because of this uh, proof of work in order to manufacture new Bitcoins. 
And that's not terrible in that it also costs an enormous amount of money to take gold out of the ground. And that was also a currency. It's a lot cheaper to print dollars or to create ledgers inside banks. But I don't know what the power consumption will do over time, but it may just become something that Bitcoin is not frictionless to run. It's just a new kind of friction of power consumption. Yeah. No, and I've heard a lot on the power argument as well, and I think that it is a concern, and I think it's something that people need to think about is, you know, where is this going to be in five years from now? Now, a lot of the numbers from the articles that I've been reading, I think are a little bit misguided because what they're doing is they're assuming that the current two megabit block that exists is going to be proportional to the number of transactions that exist moving forward and then the cost associated with that. But one of the updates that they did specifically with Bitcoin back in August with this segregated witness update is allowing off-chain transactions to occur, which you're getting a lot more transactions for the amount of energy consumption compared to what it was before, because not everything has to be on the blockchain in order to have the transaction occur. Now the settlement will occur on the blockchain, but I think you're going to see a lot more, you know, in the articles, what they're saying is based on the number of transactions that happen today, basically all power consumption will be consumed on the blockchain in three years from now. But I think what they're doing is they're interpolating a line out that doesn't account for adjustments in the software that allow more transactions per energy consumption. But there's people out there way smarter than me on this. And if you're listening and you want to point me to an article that proves me wrong, please send it to me so I can read it. You know, I I just wanted to rewind back to the question that was in there that we didn't answer. That was, I guess, was important for me to answer what podcasts I listen to. (laughs) I want to hear this one. You know, I don't listen to as many podcasts as I'd like to listen to, but I just I've got my phone here, and I just wanted to see what would come up. And so I'm just going to literally read out. So the one that comes up top is 99% Invisible. I don't know if you know that guy, Roman Mars. No. So just really high quality production values. I first heard him on TED Talks. And then there's BBC Radio, the History of Mozart and a Dozen Objects. And I've got just uh, TED Talks. And uh, some of these I, I don't actually listen to, so, so I'm kind of moving in alphabetical order right now. So there's a BBC radio podcast called Brexit, a guide for the perplexed. I'm kind of tuned into Brexit. There's a guy called Dan Carlin who's got a podcast called Hardcore History, which I really enjoy. And then just moving down. So I think the guy, I, I am sure you must know him, but I just find him really inspiring is John Lee Dumas. I don't know if you know him. I don't just, know him personally, but I definitely know who John is. Yeah. I think that one of the things you know about John Lee Dumas is that what you see is what you get. He's not pretending anything. You know, it's so funny because I sometimes use his vocabulary now with my wife, even though it's kind of, so I say, hey, honey, I'll catch you on the flip side. You know? <laughs> and uh, I haven't yet used the term to a lightning round. But the other thing that I find really wonderful about John Lee Dumas is that he's not just bringing great guests. He's kind of everybody's cheerleader. So he wants everybody. And you're like, you want your listeners to succeed, not just with their investing. You want them to live awesome lives and you want to help and you need to serve. And I think that something that's really incredible about, you know, the way technology has changed is that it allows the people who are truly servants, who want to be servant leaders to really shine. And that's kind of why the investors podcast has become successful. So that's what you guys do. And that's what John Lee Dumas does. So, so he really stands out for me. And often when I meet guests on his program, I then go to their websites and listen to stuff. And so then, you know, I, I listened to the first episode of Masters of Scale, the Reed Hoffman, which I thought was really fantastic. I thought it was really well produced with the name of the woman escapes me. You know, I mean, it's funny. I don't know if you've listened to The Art of Charm. I haven't, but I've seen it in, the, you know, honestly, Guy, this, this might surprise people. I don't listen to podcasts. I, These are I the- don't listen to any podcasts. These are all the podcasts that I want to listen to. And I'll just leave you with the last one before showing you. Here's also what I got on my phone. Hang on a second. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. Anyone? Look at that one. I know that. Uh, I know that show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're one of them. No, I see. I, I just, you got a discussion on Bitcoin. I'll have to listen to that. And I'll just give you one last one. There's a guy called Mark Bidwell. He's got a, for people who work in corporate environments, he's got a podcast called The Innovation Ecosystem. We interview some really interesting people about how to create the kind of enlightened environment that you're creating, Preston, and that John Lee Dumas creates. 
but in this case for uh, people in the corporate world who are trying to make it a little bit more and more dynamic, a little bit more open, trying to bring new ideas and any kind of shares practice. So I just wanted to get that out there because it would be fun to do. No, that's cool. Um, and you know, John Lee Dumas, he was a former army officer. We need to invite John to the Berkshire meeting in uh, May. And you know, Stig's making it this year. Stig, you know, he wasn't able to make it last year. Stig's coming this year. One of the things that I talked with Stig, and just so you know, Stig's out of town. He wasn't able to be with us for the discussion oh. today, but Stig shot me a message right before we chat and he said, remind Guy to tell our audience about going to the Berkshire meeting because here in December is when we start spreading the information about how can you go, get your tickets now, get your hotel room. So put a plug, tell people what, from your vantage point, what is the Berkshire meeting like? Well, you know, Preston, I meet so many people. I've actually got an intern in my office right now, and they kind of, they want to make a change in their life. They want to have a better career. They want to have a more meaningful, more soulful career. They want to get onto a different path to the one that they're on. And, you know, they come to me looking for advice and insight. And I kind of tell them, you know, you're just looking, you know, go to the source. Don't come to me. You know, I'm not worth talking to. So the expression is, don't seek out the master's, seek out the master's thought. And the source is Berkshire. And if you don't know what you're going to do at Berkshire, you're going to be just fine because you're going to be enveloped probably from the minute you get onto the flight to Omaha, wherever it is you're flying from. You'll just be in a crowd of people who are your crowd. And you'll be me. There'll be these meetings everywhere in Epley Field Airport all the way to the Sunday evening bar event that I'm looking forward to attending <laughs> where you'll be around awesome people. So, I, you know, there's so much one could say. I dedicated, I think, a whole chapter in my book about how the Berkshire Hathaway meeting transformed me. I was in New York City suit. I was a guy who went to the Berkshire Hathaway meetings trying to drum up business. And, you know, I don't go to the Berkshire Hathaway meetings to drum up business. I go to the Berkshire Hathaway meeting to be with my tribe. And uh, it's a big tribe, 50,000 of them. I'm not saying you're like every member of the tribe. And I'm not saying it's the only tribe one should be a member of, but it's just such an awesome tribe to be a part of. And I actually know from somebody, where did I get this? I'm going to go and speak at Bob Miles' conference this year at the Birch meeting. And I think that he had contact with Warren Buffett's office. The meeting's not going to stay like that forever, you know? Warren and Charlie are getting on in years. At some point, they're going to stop doing the meetings that way. So come experience the atmosphere before maybe one day they just funny they just don't do it anymore you know yeah no i think you're exactly right you had a really profound point there about seeking out the knowledge of the master and like where did they acquire it from what book did they read i absolutely love that point and i think it's super important for people to understand how profound that was can i ask you one more question before you go and i know you're under the weather and i'm just drilling you with all these questions but my voice is surviving fine, and we haven't gotten through to... And maybe we did. <laughs> no, I, I'm loving this, Preston. I have a great time with you, really. We had a person on Twitter ask that they wanted to have a little bit of a discussion about intrinsic value. So, mm-hmm. you know, my personal approach is through an IRR calculation, trying to figure out what the yield is based on the price today. I'm curious if that's kind of the approach that you use. I get very frustrated whenever I read... Like Morningstar, and they say, oh, the price of the stock is $115 per share, but then they don't even talk the discount rate or what that 115 even means. So I'm a big fan of IRR for that reason, and I'm curious if you are. And then what is the one thing that you think people mess up the most when doing that calculation or their intrinsic value calculation? So you know the story, there's nothing as dangerous as an MBA with a spreadsheet. I really believe if you've got the run, you've got to run the numbers on a spreadsheet. It's not cheap enough. And what I'd say is that I think that the vast majority of really good investments it comes down to insanely cheap. Nobody disputes that it's insanely cheap. It's just there's this horrible thing staring you in the face that you have to overcome, or you have to see, or understand, or reason with. So you know, one of the moments for me that was a very teachable and learnable moment was. When Warren Buffett made this huge investment, six billion investment in preferred stock of Goldman Sachs, and it was right in the middle of the financial crisis. One hundred and fifteen dollars on the book. I remember this. This is yeah, right back in 08. Yeah, and and I was like, wow, 
right in the middle. And and people like, you know, we're in the middle of a financial crisis. Companies are going bankrupt all over the place. Doesn't this, you know, and like everybody knew it was cheap. Nobody was going to buy it. Yeah. Warren Buffett didn't do an IRR calculation. Well, there's the company that, and I'm not going to mention the name. I looked at it. I did my checklist. I did my write-up. I started buying. And then I was like, wait a second. I need to figure out the price of oil. I need to figure out where it's going. And the thing is so cheap, you can't believe it. But it's trading like oil's going to stop being mined tomorrow. <laughs> but within five years, people are going to stop eating oil. So the real question is not, is it cheap? The IRL is not going to change that. It's what is my opinion on oil? Can I take the other side of this bet? So I try to get away from these kind of finely tuned calculations on what the IRR will be. There's just there's nothing wrong with saying, I think I want to own some Berkshire. I think I want to own some whatever it is. I'm just going to buy a bunch of it. And, you know, that's where I would tell you at the other end of the spectrum, I've done this a couple of times on Amazon. And I've done all the adjustments that you need to make in order to kind of understand Amazon as a normal business. And I just couldn't bring myself to buy it, you know, because it was still too expensive. But without doing an IRR, just saying, well, you know, the business has to perform this well for this long, this valuation to make sense. I mean, it was a momentum. But, yeah, it's a momentum play. And I think, yeah, for a value investor to look at that, you're always going to have a hard time with the numbers based on how high the premium is today, right? But a famous or should be famous, an extremely successful value investor called Nick Sleep. And he made a call on Amazon five years ago, put a third of his portfolio into it, you know, made, I don't know how much because he doesn't talk about it, but shut down his fund, sent an enormous amount of money back to his investors. I think made enough money for a few lifetimes of his, you know, not extravagant, but not an unextravagant lifestyle. And he's a value investor. And he called me up and he said, I was visiting him in London. He said, you got to look at this. And I just, I couldn't see it. <laughs> so some value investors do it. But so my point to the listener and my point to you is, I think you got to be all over this stuff. You got to be willing to look at value five different ways, five different lenses, do the IRR, but look at it in other ways as well. Look at replacement value, look at just all the different ways you could value it. And then just decide, is it screamingly cheap or not? And if it's not screamingly cheap, I'm not saying don't buy it, but I'm just be aware of what you're doing. All right. So, Guy, one of the major themes of our very first interview years ago was this idea of writing letters. And if I remember the quote correctly, you said something to the tune of, if I had to choose between writing letters and value investing, I would choose writing letters every day of the week. I'm curious, and one of our members of the audience wanted to know, are you still writing letters and do you still put as much emphasis and weight on the power of writing letters? And explain to people what we mean by writing letters. So, I mean, now there's a part of my book where I, and, and this is why I said that comment, is that it's only because I wrote a thank you note to Monish Bry that he knew I existed. And after I wrote a thank you note to Monish Bry, he invited me for for a dinner, it turned out. And that dinner changed my life. In fact, in my case, if you asked me whether I'd rather have that dinner with Monish Pabrai or that lunch with Warren Buffett, the dinner with Monish Pabrai was way more important for me. He introduced me to so many, so many valuable things in that dinner that I would have never have gotten to. So the way I write about in the book, writing thank you letters, writing notes of appreciation, increases optionality in your life. And the thing is, is that part of why I wanted to write the book is that people think, oh yeah, he met Monish Pabrai and then he had lunch with Warren Buffett. So he's a very lucky guy. And what I wanted to convince people of, no, well, there's a certain element of luck, but the harder you work, the luck you get. And I wanted people to know that I didn't write one random note to Monish Pabrai. At that time, I was writing like 15 thank you notes a week, you know, sort of like three a day. So when you add that up, that's uh, of the order of hundreds a year. And when you, you, know, you compound that over five years, that's getting into the thousands of letters, thousands of people being touched. So I got into a sufficiently strong habit of doing that. What is it? The chains of habit are too light to be felt until they're too hard to break. But funnily enough, I have a hard time leaving the office unless I've penned something to somebody and stuck it into the two cents pile. And I've streamlined some of it. So 
any person who meets me personally will get some piece of physical mail from me at some point. Well, let's say that 80% of them will, 20% for one reason or another, I'll decide that I don't want to send them something because they're not people that I want in my life. But the vast majority of people I do want in my life, and I send them something. So yeah, I still do that. And the real, at the core of it is whether it's a thank you note, whether it's a book, whether it's just a small token of appreciation, is giving people a little bit of joy and a little bit of a sense that I'm glad that they exist. I think it's extremely powerful. I think it works, makes the world a better place and gives me a far more beautiful life. I feel like as a result of doing that, I'm living my life bathed in an environment of people who have an initially positive reaction to me. So I'm curious. And I really, as of right now, I'm, I can't confirm it, but if you receive stuff from me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know what? The highlight of my mail for the year is whenever I get the Guy Spear Christmas card. <laughs> and I know I'm it's probably not the first person to ever tell you that because Guy's Christmas card is on epic levels. It's, it's something that no one has ever seen. I think the one last year, when you get it, it, it actually turned three-dimensional whenever you were able to unfold it. It was quite incredible, to say the least. Well, I just want to tell you that the designer of that card is somebody called Cecilia Wong. She's also designed the cover of my book. She's brilliant you know, in ways that you and I cannot understand when it comes to visual communication. So I have so much fun with that card. One of the problems that we had is that she started designing the cards and they were getting better and better. And we were on this <laughs> Sisyphean treadmill of like, how the hell do we top what we did last year? So, so I hope you like this year's one person. But, oh, but I love can't wait. I'm doing it. And it's so much fun because, and this was the talk that I gave at the Swiss CFA Society, which I think might turn into an article, which is, and maybe this is a nice point to close this uh, podcast, is that, you know, so many of us in the financial world don't actually add value. That was the nature of that whole book between Warren Buffett and protege partners. And um, that's a scary thought. And if you combine that with the idea that, you know, you can't tell if I'm lucky or skillful or lucky, then, you know, I really do hope that I've added, at the end of my career, that I would have added value to my investors because of superior investing skill. But I have to prepare for the possibility that at the end of my career, it can be provably be shown that that was not the case. And given that that is a possibility, I think it's just really important to have been a decent human being to make the world a better place in other ways. And so starting off with writing notes of appreciation is a great place to start. The best place to be is when you're doing it on industrial scale, the way Dakshana does with the Monish Pabrai's foundation. But it doesn't matter what scale you're doing it, so long as you're doing it. And I think that the professionals in our industry, in my industry, I hate it for good reason, because People consider that we cause the financial crisis. I don't believe that I've caused the financial crisis, but I think that as an industry, we have a very strong obligation to redeem ourselves in the minds of society by at least trying to make the world a better place. It's just really important to do. And so the thank you notes is a good place to start. It's not the place to end. I don't think I've done a very good job of that. Monish has done a far better job of that. But at least I'm trying, you know, and we should make some progress. And the great news is, is that it's not just about making the world a better place. It'll make your life a better place. You want to live in the world. We want to live in a world where people are grateful that we exist. You know, I can point to a few financial types, famous corporate raiders, that nobody's happy that they exist on the planet. We don't want to be that kind of person. Walk into the bar in Omaha on a Sunday night, and you've got 120 people or more who are all glad that Preston Pish exists. He's changed their lives. But we can all be that way. And here's the point. We can't all start the Gates Foundation. We can't all start the Dakshana Foundation. But we can all see individuals and say, you know what? I'm going to tell that person that they did great today. I'm going to write to that speaker and say they did great. I'm going to write to XYZ person and say, you know, that they had an impact on me, wherever it is. And when you do it in a thank you note, when you do it in a written document, it's so powerful because the person puts it in the desk drawer, they read it again, they put it up on a notice board, they reread it. There's permanent evidence of that. 
something very special. And last thing, truly last thing, Preston, it's not a zero-sum game. If your listeners do more of it, the TIP community do more of it, it doesn't take away from anyone else. It just makes the whole world a better place. So, yeah. In, <laughs> insanely profound comments, Guy. So, folks, Guy Spear, you know, the humble, very humble Guy Spear, Thank you so much for coming back on our show. For people, if you want to learn more about Guy, he has an incredible book. It's called The Education of a Value Investor. Stig and I read this. Oh, what is it's been it's been a few years now, right, Guy? Two or three years? 2014. Oh yeah. So it's been a few years now. But I'll tell you, you want to read a fantastic book. Pour into this and you're gonna be very, very happy that you did. And Guy, where else can people find out more about you? I know you're very active on well, you're not very active, but you're active on Twitter, right? Actually, I am. I am active on Twitter. I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but you can find <laughs> me on G Spear on Twitter. I do answer questions there. You know, I, most of the stuff that I put up, it's not. I can't put up on my website. It's on guyspear.com. So you can always go to that website to see stuff. But it's quite likely that if you shoot me a message on Twitter, that I'll respond. Awesome. Well, Guy, thank you for your time and uh, safe travels tonight. Now, thank you for having me on your show again, Preston. You're a good guy to have in the world. I'm grateful to be your friend. Thank you, Guy. Thanks for listening to TIP. To access the show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. To get your questions played on the show, go to asktheinvestors.com and win a free subscription to any of our courses on TIP Academy. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making investment decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the TIP Network. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. 